Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash The Rob Burgess Show. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Hello and welcome to the Rob Burgess Show. I am, of course, your host, Rob Burgess. On this, our 18th episode, our returning guest is Michael A. Wood Jr. But before we get to that, I need to take a moment to tell you about our sponsor. For you, the listeners of the Rob Burgess Show podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30 day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. A book I would personally recommend that pertains to this episode is The Art of Empathy, a training course in life's most essential skill, written and read by Carla McLaren. Whatever book you pick, you can exchange it at any time, you can cancel at any time, and the books are yours to keep. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash The Rob Burgess Show. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash The Rob Burgess Show for your free audiobook. Please consider supporting those who support the show like Audible. You'll be helping me out, and it won't cost you a thing. Another totally free way you can help the show is to comment, follow, like, subscribe, share, rate, and review everywhere the podcast is available. Whether it's iTunes, YouTube, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play Music, Facebook, Twitter, TuneIn, or RSS, you can find links to everything on the official website, www therobburgessshow.com You can also find out more about me by visiting my website www.thisburgess.com Back to today's show. You first heard from Michael A. Wood Jr. on episode 4 of the podcast. If you haven't heard that episode yet, pause this episode and go back to listen to it. Michael is a Baltimore-based police reform activist who, after spending a career in the United States Marine Corps and Baltimore Police Department, has torn down the blue wall of silence. He's become a vocal advocate of a new era of civilian-led policing. While completing his doctorate studies, Michael works as much as possible with grassroots activism on the streets of Baltimore, where his most valuable lessons were learned and makes media and speaking appearances to further the discussion on police reform and the needs of the people. You can find him on Facebook and Twitter. You can also find his website at michaelawoodjr.net. He is also a speaker for Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. Their website can be found at leap.cc. A quick programming note, in the 48 hours between when we recorded this on Wednesday and when it's dropping today on Friday, the following news broke. Alton Sterling was killed by police on video in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Philando Castile was killed by police on video in Falcon Heights, Minnesota. Five police officers were killed and seven were injured by a shooter in Dallas, Texas. You won't hear Michael and I discuss any of these incidents on this episode, but rest assured, the next time he's on, we'll get to all of them. Still, this conversation is very relevant. And now, on to the show. Hello. Hey, how's it going? What's up? I'm a little irritated with myself right now because I can't find these damn headphones that I want to find. But <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's all good. Well, I can, I can call you back here in a minute if you want to keep uh, looking. No, I can't find the damn things. I just spent the 15 minutes looking for them. I can't find them. I'll give up. <laughs> okay. So, uh, well, thanks for coming back on the, the podcast, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, it's uh, it's been an interesting uh, couple weeks here since the last time we talked. Um, you uh, you went back on the uh, the Joe Rogan Experience uh, podcast, which was I enjoyed greatly, uh, just like last time. But uh, uh, <laughs> I remember the last time we talked, I asked you if you were uh, scared for your safety as far as speaking out. And, and now I feel like I almost want to ask you that again, but this time in <laughs> reference to guns. Uh, <laughs> I feel like you really poked the old 
called a hornet's nest with that one. So uh, <laughs> if you want to just go ahead and say what your uh, what your basic thoughts on, on guns are and, and kind of how that relates to kind of what's been going on in the news here. Well, the big thing with guns is that I really don't have – a position. It seems like I have a position, but I really don't. What I'm saying is, is that uh, the way that it's worded, worded in the in the Second Amendment, mm-hmm. is clearly up for debate. There are ten logical and rational approaches that you can take to say this is what this means. So that alone is enough for us to all stop and say, wait, we need to reconsider this. What does it mean? What does it mean in light of a new environment? What does it mean in the light of new technology? Like, we have to just rethink it. That's the point of amendments. Mm -hmm. And I think that because I don't buy the claim that whatever we're gaining from having the status quo is worth 32,000 gun deaths a year. Mm -hmm. I'm just like that. That, that math doesn't add up for me, and I don't think it adds up for the most of the country. So the thing is, is we all agree on gun control. Um, we don't want people to have nuclear weapons. We don't even want other countries to have <laughs> nuclear weapons. So we all agree on gun control. The matter, the question is just where we're going to draw this line. Mm-hmm. So I just want to have an open, honest discussion about where we draw this line because it's obviously uh, in the wrong place at the moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I thought one interesting uh, point you made was about the uh, – if you break down the actual text of the Second Amendment, uh, talking about the militia part, I feel like people that defend the, the Second Amendment you know, uh, to the end, they, they just seem to gloss over that. But it, it seems like a pretty important opening you know, part of it because it kind of influences the rest of the statement. So when, when you see the word militia, what does that mean to you? Right. So I don't that and that but but that's another part of the good example is mm-hmm. what is a militia? Like what was it then mm-hmm. and what does that mean now? So I, I you know, words change, you know, the definitions of how things are done change. A buggy uh five hundred years ago would be the exact that would be a completely different uh, word than buggy now, you know, just as a, as a weird example. Right. But so like I don't know. I mean, I think that they're talking about uh if you're if you're in a less controlled environment like that where a bunch of guys group up and they uh have weapons, I would assume this is more closely related related to like a neighborhood set. So it's like a gang member, but they're white and they have money and <laughs> they wrote the laws, so it's not a gang to them. Sure. So a militia is a gang. A gang is just a well-organized group of people the same way. I mean, just right. a street gang does the same things. So it, to me, it sounds like a gang that wants to form up against its enemies of a local jurisdiction, probably coming from England where you have like these little, what do they even call them? You have these territories. No, oh, right. You know, territorial army. History. Yeah, right. Sure. <laughs> so it's, an evol- it's logical that that's an evolution of that. If we take that evolution, then that would probably be the National Guard if you wanted to have a, a comparison. But I just, I'm not even sure militia is a relevant term in 2016. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And I, I seriously doubt the founders could even imagine what a gun now looks like compared to the five shots a minute, <laughs> you know, black powder muskets that they were probably had in mind there. So, like, the definition of the word gun has definitely changed over time. Time too, so. Right, and that's the one thing that they foresaw. Right, I mean, mm-hmm. the one thing that they foresaw is that they weren't, they weren't be, they couldn't procras- uh, prognosticate the future. Mm-hmm. So they put in the process for amendments, and the process for amendment is is the civil way to have a revolt. I mean, that's that's what a an amendment is a revolution to our country, and we can now do that through their genius in in a completely nonviolent manner that doesn't require us to fight against tyranny in that way. We can. Actually Actually, just do it by banding together and creating an amendment. Right, right. I also thought your idea about the armory uh, was interesting, having guns kind of at a centralized location that people could check in and out. Um, but I guess a lot of people probably wouldn't be too fond of that because they want it at the ready or whatever. But that seems like a good, you know, if you do just want it for hunting or whatever, or just to shoot. Well, that's or, the thing is, yeah. right, the, the founders, they're not talking about hunting. They're talking about fighting tyranny. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, is in modern life, light, is your claim of home defense and is your claim of hunting a valid claim? I think so. Mm-hmm. So so how do we do home defense? 
a shotgun is by far the most superior home defense weapon. This is not a question. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone that wants to put up a decision that you should use another weapon for home defense needs to go to a class. They're, the shotgun is by far your best home defense weapon. So if you want to protect your home, have the damn shotgun. I don't care. That makes perfect sense to me. Uh, if you want to go hunting and you uh, say, you know, people even say crazy things like, I want to go wild boar hunting, so I need this crazy gun. Okay, that's fine. But you don't need that in your house. So even if it's something like an Isaac Walton League or an NRA Evolution, that's where you keep your gun. When you take your stamp, you, ha you need to have your stamp and your qualifications, mm -hmm. and you can go get your gun from that Isaac Walton League thing, go out hunting, and return it. Just like Because if, if that's what it's for, hunting, mm -hmm. then that's a logical hunting approach. Right. Exactly. Um, now, what do you think of the uh, idea of like smart guns as far as like uh, fingerprint and like wearing a ring and you know activating it that way? Is that something? that you think could help solve this problem? I certainly think technology is part of this equation. Mm -hmm. um, the the RFID ring mm -hmm. seems to be a lot more reliable of a technology and something I, I think is, is probably more rational, but let that up for the guys that do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I would like to do, for example, on a gun buyback, this is just my ideas, though. So if you have a Glock, like, look, a RFID Glock, uh, is going to be a heck of a lot more money than a regular Glock. Of course. So maybe you need to trade in three handguns, and we can give you your Glock with the RFID technology, and that's a good way to lower the number of guns that are on the street as long as we stop doing manufacturing and we think about rethink this. Right. And we, you know, we've seen, I think I heard you mention this too, we've seen what happens in places like Australia when, when we do these type of things, and, and the data is there to suggest that, you know, mass shootings and whatever does go down when you implement these things. Yeah. So. yeah, can we address this real quick? Because <laughs> what people like to do to me is they uh -huh. say, you can't use Australia as an example because it's small. Mm -hmm. Do they not understand how sample sizes work and what that means and that every single argument that they have that's based off of statistical analysis is, been rel is, is predicated upon sample sizes being agreed upon? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't understand how we Australia isn't a shining example. Yeah. Um, like, <laughs> you can't say it's too small or it's different. That's what sample sizes are. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, right. Um, while we're talking about the Constitution here, one thing I didn't get to ask you last time we talked was kind of about the how the Fourth Amendment relates to policing. Um, I know in uh, Chicago they've just started something uh, with the predictive policing. I don't know if you've seen that, where they're using large data sets to try to predict, predict who's most likely to commit crimes. It kind of reminded me of the movie Minority Report, of course, but um, what do you think of, of that kind of policing? Is that good, bad? How do you see that? None of those ideas are remotely new. Um, people like to come out and bring them back up every once in a while. But this is what we've been doing. We've been doing this just in a subconscious level. So what you're going to get is just official subconscious implicit bias. Mm. Um, you actually, you can't, if you have a history, so our entire criminal history of what we think of as criminality is obviously, and, and, and we've proven it, to be ripe with implicit bias. Mm -hmm. So all that data contains the implicit bias. So you would just be codifying implicit bias. Mm. Right. Yeah. It seems like a, it seems like a real problem. It doesn't seem like it seems like it would lead to bad <laughs> bad outcomes, to say the least. Um, and now, as far as uh, surveillance and stuff goes, also um, I know that certain police departments are also kind of turning to drones uh, to try to take up some of the slack for for surveillance and things like that. How do you, do you see the place for drones and things like that in policing? Okay. The the the. The cop side of me that's thinking tactically wants to say, yeah, drones, I don't know, that sounds kind of cool. Um, but then the other side of me is, like, catching the visual of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the, the – probably the biggest lesson I've had in the last year is, is what I did is I just ended up uh, – I realized that to learn this, I had to, like, submit myself – to the city, to Baltimore, mm -hmm. and and get like a a real crash course in what it's like mm -hmm. on the other side. Mm -hmm. And part of that was 
the constant presence of that goddamn helicopter. Mm. And and it's it's eerie and it's creepy. Like we can't have conversations. You can't do things because you have to like stop in the middle of things and wait while this helicopter hovers above you mm. and it's like that big brother thing and it feels really creepy and wrong. So I, I would have to go against it, even though I understand there's a good argument on the other side. Right, right, definitely. Um, so now it, there's also been a couple of Fourth Amendment cases in front of the Supreme Court that have to do with policing here lately. Um, one of them was out of North Dakota uh, where they were talking about how uh, breath tests but not blood tests without warrants are allowed under the Fourth Amendment. Uh, I was going to ask you about that, and then I, I saw on your Twitter where you had this uh, article that I went and read about in South Dakota Dakota, how they are um, <laughs> extracting urine samples by force uh, by using catheters and whatnot. So <laughs> that seems like it's got to violate something. So, um, but what's your uh, what's your take on that decision? I, I, uh, that certainly is violating something. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, well, like so. I- these things, while they're like legal and logical, what they're driven by is that constant punishment and that constant fining and that constant, you know, that same big brother thing that we have mm-hmm. looming over us because policing has been about, it's structured to get people into the system, into mm-hmm. jail. There isn't like an incentive for cops to find uh, potential people who may potentially leave the bar intoxicated and thwart that activity in a productive manner before they go drunk driving. Like that's not a program that exists anywhere in the country. Mm-hmm. So so there, it, it's just a, a result of when you have management and ideologies that say our goal is to incarcerate people, well, you're just going to come up with new and inventive ways and push the legal boundaries on how you can incarcerate incarcerate people. It's, it's, it's so human instinct and something that's not going to happen even necessarily on the surface. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, now, there was another Supreme Court case uh, last year uh, out of North Carolina that's had some pretty big implications. I don't know if you've uh, been following this at all, but it was, a, it was to do with a traffic stop where a, a police officer stopped uh, somebody who had a taillight out, but it turned out that North Carolina law doesn't say you have to have two working taillights, just one, uh, and the they found uh, drugs in the car, but they were going to throw that out because, you know, the stop itself was not legal. But the Supreme Court said um, that as long as they thought that the stop was legal, that was good enough. That it doesn't actually have to actually be legal. Um, it just has to, in the whoever, you know, the, the cop's mind, I guess, it just has to be a, a reasonable thing to pull someone over for. Um, I don't know if you've, you've heard of that case or had any, had any thoughts on that, but, but what yeah, yeah, of course, I've heard about it, yeah. and I saw it, and, I mean, it, it upsets a lot of what we've predicated the rest of our criminal justice philosophy and investigative philosophy on. Right. So the fruit of a poisonous tree was always a concept. Like, if you screw up from the beginning, everything that from that point on is screwed up, and, and that check and balance on saying you can't screw up from the beginning. Mm-hmm. And that, that's why rules like that are in place. So that's entire, completely upsetting it. And when you compound it with that all of our data is implicitly biased towards, you know, whether it's minorities or being poor or whatever, you, you have all those different factors. Mm-hmm. So you, you're, again, you're, you're, you're codifying um, going against these communities. Because what ends up happening is when you have uh, hyper-segregated communities and you have t- towns like Baltimore, Ferguson, and Chicago, they they create tons and tons of warrants on people. And Baltimore's got like 60,000 outstanding warrants. Mm. So what that means is that as long as you get warrants on people, then whatever you do to them will be fine. Mm. So then you just incentivize officers to go out and get warrants all the time on everybody for everything. Because I have seen officers go out of – get out of hand uh, – arrest somebody when they shouldn't have, Mm -hmm. and then find out that they have a warrant, and it's like, whew, it just wipes it all away, even though that was wrong and they won't tell the truth about it. Mm -hmm. That presence of that warrant makes everything disappear, Mm -hmm. and that's going to a new level now. Right, right. Well, if you want to go back to the uh, Walter Scott thing, uh, you know, he was pulled over for a taillight, but do you have another case of that not actually being the state law, and, you know, that should not have, 
you know, nobody should have been pulling him over for that. It was just that it's, you know, they, the officer, Michael Slager, thought that was good enough, and then they turned into what we saw or whatever. And, and obviously the, the warrants figure into that as well because he had warrants for uh, child support. Now, um, I was going to ask you about this too. What do you think about uh, having warrants for, for child support? It seems like that's a, that's a way to keep people in the system for a long time. Yeah, I mean, so that's a, essentially a debtor's prison. And anytime you have a version of a debtor's prison, you're creating that cycle. And that's why we've outlawed desert, uh, debtor's prisons, but we still, in effect, have them. And we only have them on the weak people, right? It doesn't, I mean, there's no debtor's prison for the Clintons. No. There, there's only a debtor's <laughs> prison for the people that are on welfare or yeah, somewhere below uh, upper middle class. Uh-huh. Definitely. Well, that that leads right into something else I wanted to talk about. And as you mentioned, the Clintons. Uh, last time you we talked, you said that you thought Bernie Sanders uh, was probably the best potential uh, candidate for police reform. Uh, obviously, uh, things have changed since uh, since we talked, and, and you know Bernie doesn't look like he's probably going to get the nomination at this point. And obviously, just yesterday they announced that the Hillary is not going to be indicted or whatever for the email. So, uh, how are you feeling about the election now, as far as who you? You would want to put your support behind as far as police reform or anything else? All right, well, hashtag it. Hashtag Jill, not Hill. How about that? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, so you're going, going Green Party then, not not Libertarian Party? You're not interested in that? Um, like, so I've talked to a lot of Libertarians, and I, Libertarians, obviously on gun control, like Libertarians generally could have, completely disagree with me. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, uh, I'm just going to be straight up, I think Libertarians uh, have a few good ideas, mm-hmm. but I think it's an untenable Hmm. ideology. Hmm. Um, reality is going to put you into this situation. For everyone that wants to say, like, look, America is the most productive country in the history of the world. It is. It is the most productive country that has ever existed. Hmm. So, like, doing things to thwart that doesn't make sense to me, because what you're going to do is you're just going to get to a point where one person gets poisoned by a steak, okay, so you need the FDA again, and then, you know, it's just, we're here for, for reasons. Mm-hmm. Right, right. I, I saw a political cartoon once that was, uh, the caption was Libertarian Lifeguard, and it's a lifeguard just standing with their arms folded as someone's, uh, you know, drowning, and they're like, you know, save yourself, you know, or whatever. Just, right, you know, exactly. There's no, there's Doesn't no make sense to me. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> um, so last time we talked, you were applying to be the police commissioner of uh, Chicago, and that didn't work out, sadly. But I did see a petition come through where you were trying to be the uh, Oakland police commissioner. Um, I guess first explain what happened with Chicago. Um, what, did they? I guess they just chose someone else for that? <laughs> no, no, they did worse than that. Okay. Chicago has a police board. The police board is supposed to nominate the three candidates for commissioner. Mm-hmm. And instead, what they they nominated their three candidates that the mayor was supposed to choose from. Uh, Rahm Emanuel said, "Oh, that's great. Um, I'm going to choose this other guy that didn't even apply." <laughs> and then they went, and the county, the city council, literally went and changed the law so that he could pull off that bit of corruption. Mm. So everyone that said Chicago was incredibly corrupt is is obviously correct, and that was blatantly on the surface. Mm. But the good news is, is that see what it is. I say I'm not ready. Uh, like the like policing, the country's not ready for like the reform yet. So you're going to see gradual progress, I, I think. And I didn't start the Oakland and San Francisco thing, so that's a good idea of progress. Mm-hmm. Um, citizens from around the country uh, and San Francisco and Oakland have been starting petitions and saying, "Hey, this is what we want," and that's what it's going to take. It's going to take enough of the city to say that we demand this change because it's a change that involves power going away from those that have power. So they're not going to want to do that. This isn't going to be voluntary. Mm -hmm. Uh, Once we have a city that presses far enough, then we're going to get that change and we're going to implement the model. It's really just a matter of time. All I can do is try to encourage that time. Right, right. Now, Oakland in particular has had, uh, let's say, some problems with their uh, police commissioners here lately. (laughs) (laughs) Unprecedented (laughs) problems. Exactly. Um, but it, what what kind of if you were to get that 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 gig in the Bay Area there, either for San Francisco or Oakland, what what would your first kind of initiatives be to try to try to fix things there? 
Yeah, and, and it should really fall in line with everything that everybody knows about me. Is I'm not actually trying to tell you what to do. I'm trying to tell the politicians that the only way this works is by you telling me what to do. Mm-hmm. That, that's just the – when it comes down to the basics of it, you must have civilian-led policing. It's the only thing that has a model that can continually fuel itself into uh, serving the actual community instead of serving the power structure. Mm-hmm. So that the first thing – I won't take a job that doesn't involve – uh, the community uh, community board taking over the police department and then me being responsible to serving them. So that is the biggest uh, single issue would be the way the uh, hierarchy is done. Mm. Um, and so when you want to talk about actual moves, the first thing I have to do is totally, is totally restructure our, our misdemeanor approaches to narcotics is the first thing I have to do because I, I'm convinced uh, uh, through experience and through education and through evidence that the vast majority of our problems come from this drug war. So we have to end that and start uplifting, uplifting communities and finding ways other than incarceration. And I, I'd like... I don't think any of this is a hard sell. Mm-hmm. Uh, while it may be radical, I don't think I can be in a room and lose this argument. Mm-hmm. Right. And as far as the drugs thing go, I think I remember hearing you say this on the Joe Rogan podcast, but um, you were talking about how the, you can just leave if the feds want to enforce drug laws, they can do that. But if, it, but locally you have the power whether or not to enforce locally. Is that is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah. And what's interesting is a lot of people don't know this. The lower you are on the police uh, paradigm, so to say, the actually the more power you have. Mm. So if you are a local podunk cop, right, mm. say you, you run a municipal department somewhere in Pennsylvania, your little territory can have ordinances. So you can enforce those ordinances, you can enforce the traffic laws, you can enforce the county laws, you can enforce the state laws, and you can enforce the federal laws. Mm-hmm. So you have all the power. The higher up you go, okay, the county can't enforce the city ordinance. The state can't enforce the county or the local ordinances. And the feds can't enforce the state, the county, or the local ordinances. So you, you have a tremendous amount of influence on what actually happens on your streets. And if the feds want to come in and, and, and bust everybody that has heroin pill in their pocket, by all means, go for it. But I, I, that's a complete waste of resources for me, and it hurts the community. Mm-hmm. Right, right. That totally makes sense. Um, now, to kind of shift gears a little bit to Baltimore again, uh, we talked a little bit about the Freddie Gray case um, last time, and, and there's been two uh, decisions to let two of the officers be cleared by that. And I thought it was also interesting that these have been bench trials, not jury trials. So it's all the same judge that's uh, doing this, Judge Williams, I guess. Um, and now they're uh, over another uh, one of the officers, uh, Lieutenant Rice, it looks like. Um, um, how hopeful are you that there's going to be any justice in this case at this point? Well, none of us should have been ever hopeful that there would be any justice mm. in this case. That would be illogical. We've been spending the last year or so telling you how bad the system is. Mm-hmm. Um, if I'm right, then there's no conviction. Right. Well, I think people so, so. got kind of excited <laughs> with the prosecutor, though. Uh, Mo- 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 Mosby, she seemed like everyone was super excited at the beginning, and now not so much. But <laughs> Not so much now. Yeah. Okay. Totally not so much. Whether it's through intent or ineptness, I don't know. But th- <laughs> these cases are complete trash. I mean, for ex- example, the biggest – there's two big revelations in this case mm-hmm. that – She's not even hitting on. And the first one is is the complete lack of supervision and, and managerial issues. Like, they are letting it, it be that an officer – they're saying to the officer, uh, whoever – who taught you this? Did you know how to do this? And the officers are all going, no, no, we don't know anything, never had anything. Well, that's a complete – that's the example of the complete ineptitude and supervision failure of everyone above them who are legally responsible to teach these people these things. Mm-hmm. And they don't, they don't even hint on that issue whatsoever because that's going against the power structure. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing is this reasonable officer standard. So the defense keeps bringing in expert witnesses to say what these officers did was reasonable because other officers agree that they would do that. 
Mm-hmm. Well, popularity doesn't equal reasonability. Mm. So they're making an argument of popularity for something to be reasonable, which is ridiculous. And I've offered to the state's attorney, like, look, I'll go testify that a reasonable officer is a reasonable officer, not a popular officer or the common officer. Like, only the citizens can judge what is reasonable for an officer to do. You can't have officers judge reasonableness. That's a, it's a illogical circle. What do you do when all the officers are unreasonable? Mm-hmm. And then you've, you've codified irrationality. Right. So, uh, so that those two big issues. So if she's not hitting on them, it's either out of intent or ineptness. So if she either intends on losing these cases, or or she's completely inept. Right. Well, it seemed like they made a big show of oh, we're going to get justice at the beginning, but I'm, I'm assuming that maybe it had to more to do with just kind of quell the people on the streets or whatever in the in the meantime and try to get the heat off of them. And uh, the it certainly appears you're correct. Yeah. <laughs> Um, now, I know that a lot of these cases, I, I know this happened with Tamir Rice, especially since we, we talked last, that the um, yeah, obviously they decided not to you know, put any charges on the officers, but then in civil, uh, you know, civil proceedings, they got a, a large payout, and that seems to be what, how it goes down. You know, Eric Garner, I remember there was a similar thing with his family, got a multi-million dollar payout from that. Why aren't they seeing that this is costing so much money to settle these things in these ways, uh, that rather than change? I mean, it's it just compounds the insult, right? Mm-hmm. So, so the people in these communities are paying for a service that's supposed to protect them. When that service kills them, mm-hmm. they then pay for that responsibility. Mm-hmm. Preposterous, right? So, the thing is, is, is they don't have to pay for that, so they don't care. Mm-hmm. Like, everything that's civil gets swept under the rug, and it doesn't look bad on the mayor's career. It doesn't look bad on the city council's career or the police department's career because those things happen, and they're all swept under the rug. I mean, we all seem to forget that Freddie Gray was the fourth person that this happened to within the last 20 years. Wow. Fourth. So no one's changing. It's just a matter of who's actually paying attention. And now that people are paying attention, it seems like the system just doesn't know what to do in the light of people looking. Yeah, and I also thought it was a pretty bold defense. I don't remember who was making this argument, but it was near the beginning of the case where, oh, maybe he killed himself or whatever. It's like, Mm -hmm. okay, well, even if that's true, why was he allowed to be in a position to do that? Right, you're still responsible (laughs) even if he kills himself when he's in your custody for a man that has no liberty and is handcuffed and shackled. Yeah. God. Right, (laughs) exactly. I don't understand how to handle this in a (laughs) non-emotional, non-aggravated fashion when you're talking about taking somebody's liberty away, shackling them, putting them in a metal box, and then bringing them out dead, and then you go, oh, you know, you never know what happened. Bullshit. <laughs> right. And then, you know, the knife, I don't, I don't remember. That probably wasn't even, they said it was a switchblade at first, and then it turned out not to be. It was just a regular knife, and, you know. Yeah, yeah let's talk about that real quick. Mm-hmm. So the knife, right. Every single Hispanic construction worker and white construction worker in that city carries that same very same knife. Almost every cop carries spring-assisted knives. Mm -hmm. The thing is, is no one looks for them. Mm -hmm. So what ends up happening is that you only enforce those laws in that community. So even if the the knife was illegal, I'm not sure the law is illegal. In Ohio, what happened was they had gun laws in multiple jurisdictions, Mm -hmm. right? So the Supreme Court of uh, Ohio got involved. Because it was, it's like it's rational, right? So if you have a state that says you can have a concealed gun, and then each jurisdiction gives you new rules, well, then it becomes impossible to navigate your space legally. Mm-hmm. And that would be the same thing for the knife. There are 24 jurisdictions in Baltimore, in Maryland. Mm-hmm. Only one, Baltimore City, is a spring-assisted pocket knife illegal. Mm-hmm. So you are expecting everyone. It, to know that suddenly the laws have changed because you crossed the border, mm-hmm. um, and, and that Supreme Court of Ohio has, has said that that's that's not that's not constitutional. Hmm. Interesting. Um, yeah, I didn't but really... she didn't attack that either. You know, like, right. are you trying? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, if you were in one of these officers' shoes, though, do you think how would you have handled this situation differently? Because you know, running. I think the thing was that they were saying, "Oh, he's running away from the police," and that causes this to be suspicious. What What do you make of that? Well, that's why this whole fallout 
really goes on rice, mm -hmm. the one who orders it, mm -hmm. right? So, um, in reality, no matter what, and I don't, I can't, I don't see a, a way around this. If if an officer, any officer, tells another officer, "Hey, go do this." They they, ha they they should do it, whatever that is. But the responsibility for that falls on the people making on, on whoever gave that order. I mean, if you just think about it, a cop goes chasing somebody around the corner. You say, "Hey, stop him!" Mm -hmm. That doesn't. I mean, like you don't have time to be like, "Well, why are we pursuing this young man at the moment?" So y you have to do that, and that means everything falls on Lieutenant Rice, especially since he has the rank. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it depends where you are in the situation. If you're one of those officers, yeah, you just follow along because you don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then you figure it out later. But when you're figuring it out later is the point where you have to go, oh, wait, I'm not down with this. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, um, I'm, I'm completely shocked that, like, Nero and Miller, the two bike cops that really had no clue what was going on, I'm surprised that they didn't snitch right away or, you know, cooperate or get immunity or, or something. I mean, that's, that's certainly the first thing I would have done, whether it's it's immoral or not. My rule at the time was, is I'm not going to say shit, but if we're like, I'm not going to testify, I'm not going to lie for you. So it, it was like, if you get caught, well, then I'm telling, and I'm really surprised that that didn't happen here. Yeah, for sure. Um, now, to switch switch gears again, uh, I was looking through your Twitter, and I saw this one tweet where you were talking about how, uh, um, you know, they, they have police departments that show, uh, like, photos of, of uh, you know, officers in the community with kids and whatever, and I noticed you labeled one of these with the hashtag cop prop. Uh, can you explain what your, what, your, what your problem with that is and what the concept behind that, that hashtag is? <laughs> sure, if anybody would like to see a primary example of this at the moment, you can go on Commissioner Davis's um, Twitter profile and you'll see that his main picture is him sitting there squatting with two young black kids looking at him like, what the hell are you standing here squatting next to me and taking a picture for? <laughs> and what he is doing, he use, they, the police in general, they use these kids like, look, we're helping. But a week later, they're locking those same kids up on the corner and the cops that are talking to them aren't actually the cops that are on the street. They set up these neighborhood communities community police officers who go around to different communities doing these things, but it's not the actual cops in their neighborhood. So you're not making any difference at all. It's just a PR stunt. Hmm. And then I saw you also had something where it was like, do it without the uniform. So does that mean doing it without, you know, having it be a big production? And Okay. So, so I, I try not to trump myself up, <laughs> you know, but let's, let's do this example. Okay. Let's say I get the job in Oakland. Mm -hmm. Okay. The way I do it is I have shorts and maybe a hoodie on, and I hop on my Ducati, and I have no gun, I have no knife, I have a cell phone in my pocket, and I go to the so-called worst neighborhoods, and I act like a normal human being hmm. and talk to people and do things. This is what I do in Baltimore now. Right? I don't go to Baltimore armed. I don't, I, I don't go in there fearful. I go in there with regular clothes into whatever neighborhood to talk to everybody, to, to have a normal relationship with them. I am, when, it's my, when they're doing an event, I'm there to support them, not to get a picture taken of me. I'm there to film them. I'm there to use my platform to give them a bigger audience. If you want to do something for your community instead of using a kid as a picture and a prop, well, then let that kid speak that's a dissenter to you and then share their information. You know, Use your platform. Use your bully pulpit to actually care about these communities instead of just using them as some, uh, you know, look at me, look at me, what am I, look at what I'm doing. When you have, they, I mean, they're, they have no association to what these communities want, need, uh, how they feel. It's completely an us versus them, and they want to take a picture that goes like, look, we're the same, but nothing is the same. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's 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 fair enough. Yeah. Um, now I also saw where you were a guest on the Young Turks again, and uh, you also were arrested in Washington D.C. at a protest there with uh, Jake Unger. Um, what was that protest about? <laughs> Uh, so the protest was Democracy Spring, and there was a whole week uh, protest, which was to get money out of politics and to draw attention to that. It was the largest um, arrest at the D.C. Capitol. Mm. Um, we had like 280 people or something that day. Mm -hmm. And um, the whole point of that is, is while money in politics is a big issue and while I am also focused on policing, 
I do think that the biggest issue is getting rid of the drug war, and I don't see my path to getting rid of the drug war without getting money out of politics to start getting politicians that actually serve evidence and the people. Mm -hmm. So, like, I have to participate that in that just as much as I participate in Black Lives Matter or in police reform because these things are all just intrinsically tied together. Well, yeah, you have to fix one before you can fix anything else for sure. Um, now, what what would your method be for trying to get the money out of politics? What would you, how would you go about doing that? Yeah, I mean, I agree with Jenk that, that the amendment is the way to do it mm -hmm. um, because that is our peaceful revolution. Mm -hmm. you know, that is the system in place for us to have a peaceful revolution. And I think that's going to happen eventually. Uh, Wolfpack is going to win that battle. They're, they're progressing. It's just, it's another one of those things where it's a matter of time. Mm -hmm. And, and it, like, whether it's police reform or Black Lives Matter or this, again, it, it's all these things will be victories because the evidence is on our side. We have a progressive country, believe it or not. You know, the, the media is not going to tell you that. The country is by far progressive. Mm -hmm. So all these things will achieve. You know, once people, one, I, I think that once the millennials are, are relatively uh, and, and younger are relatively the more dominant of society, mm -hmm. then pretty much all this is over and, and we'll, we'll move on. But we have to keep pushing to make these things happen faster because people die and communities are destroyed and the country goes more corrupt and more power goes to the top, to the oligarchy than it, than it does to the people. So each day of delay is harm to our, our society. Right. Uh, as far as elections go, though, do you think that publicly funded elections is the, is the way we should go about it as opposed to having all these dark money super PAC type things? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that seems to be the only rational approach. Mm -hmm. And I thought about that a lot because this police board that I want in my ideal model, one of the biggest questions is, is where does this board come from? Mm -hmm. Right. So they, they have to come from the community. If, if there's, we have an oversight of the police department, it must come from the community, but it must not come from the mayor and be appointed. Mm -hmm. So where do I get these people from? And like a publicly funded, uh, free, like a level playing field is the only uh, solution I, I can have at the moment. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm open to other ideas. I just can't come up with them. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, that makes sense. I mean, yeah, it's got to come from somewhere. And, you know, if, if you don't have that, then you just have the people with the most money who can, who can put themselves in place because that's the only way they can make it feasible for them to take their time up by doing this. You know what I mean? So, right. So um, I, I don't have another answer. But okay. if you get one, let me know. <laughs> I'll let you know for sure. Um, I also saw on Twitter a while ago that you had gotten into it with David Simon, creator of The Wire, and I, what, what was that about, man? I was disappointed. I was like, oh no, I want these two to be friends. <laughs> um, well, I think there's zero chance of that happening. Uh -oh. um, so, I, I've become to see David Simon as an exploiter instead of an assister. Ooh, okay. Well, what's and the difference? I, I think that continues to be what he does. And what we got in an argument over, though, was police issues. And what he does is he has his celebrity, and people listen to him. And so if he says something that's blatantly wrong, he has people believing that. So he said something blatantly wrong about policing. I don't remember what it was. And I was like, hey, that is completely wrong. You have no idea what you're talking about. Don't mm -hmm. do that. And, and he stood by his word and, and ended up just blocking me because he didn't, you know, that's what happens when people don't want to actually have, you know, I mean, his, that's why the point is so strong, but yet who, who he doesn't want to put up a reasonable argument for it. You know, we can do this someplace else. He's, he's in New York. He can come down to Baltimore and we can do this on a stage. You can win your argument and shut me up. That's not going to happen. So uh, Now, when you say that he's an exploiter, do you think that he had things like The Wire and other things like that give... Well, yeah, because he's not trying to uplift those communities. He's mm. still talking shit about how these communities are still so bad. Look at how gross this is. Mm. Well, then get your ass in there and uplift these communities. Ask them what they need. Ask them what you can do for them instead of punching down. When you punch down, I get pissed and I get aggressive. Mm -hmm. well, so, yeah. like, people are going to have to deal with that with me. If you ever... I, I don't know how I can change that in my personality, but when I see somebody with power punch down, like, I don't know, like a switch goes off. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I always liked The Sopranos more than The, the Wire, anyway. So uh, that's fine with me. Um, but um, so, uh, how are your uh, how are your doctorate studies going? Um, I mean, I, th- I it looks uphill right now because I just finished advanced quantitative research methodology. Mm. And which means I never have to touch that again. What is, what is that? No what, is that? what does that mean? Before you go, it's like <laughs> statistics and like how you find out, like if you're going to do a survey, like how you pull the information out of that, uh, how you run analytics on everything. And I'm not into stats, and I'm not into analytics, and I'm not into math. Mm. So, <laughs> so I'm very happy that that is over. I have no intention of doing quantitative research, and I'm glad I got that 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 out of the way. So now everything looks. Uh, very optimistic and up that I have. <laughs> don't have to deal with that anymore. Yeah, um, but other than that, everything's going good. I mean, um, you learn stuff as you go. But the reality is, is I would learn a lot more if I was just sitting here learning about what I want to learn about. Instead, I have to do this systematic checking of the boxes so I can have the qualification. So you know, that's what everybody says. Or well, were you in that unit? Did you do this? You don't know unless you've done that. Mm-hmm. So I've really spent my career trying to check all those boxes. I want it to be. People say, "Oh, you haven't written a book." Yes, I have. <laughs> uh, you, you you haven't actually led people. Yes, I have. You don't know what it's like. You know, maybe if you had an actual education. I have a fucking PhD. So, so that's that's my whole like right. it's been an obsession I've had for the last you know ten or fifteen years because that is our society. They just they'll want to know true Scotsman you any chance they get. So I've kind of dedicated myself to eliminating their ability to know true Scotsman. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, are you still uh, doing things with Leap? Uh, do you have any upcoming things planned with them? Sure. Um, so I'm like totally the wrong person to ask about what I have upcoming because. Mm-hmm. I don't know. <laughs> and I still work with Leap. Um, we do as much as we can. Um, Leap uh, would normally be more active with a member because they would be, be want to push him to get him speaking events. But usually with me, I'm like, I don't want to do it no more. Like, <laughs> give me a break. So so we, we're we just, uh, it's more of a friendly relationship right now because they don't have to worry about getting me on track and uh, getting out there and get the message. I mean, I know what we're we're talking about here so okay um, you know, that's just like a support group really okay i see um now i uh, i'm interested in your radio revolver project that you're working on and the gofundme page associated with that uh can you kind of explain what the concept behind that is real quick all right so radio revolver i don't know if we're going to keep the name mm. but um the concept and, and the project progress will still be there we're getting close now and what we have is um if people are familiar with the adnad saeed case mm-hmm. Um, who just got a, his conviction vacated, and hopefully we'll be getting bail and getting free soon because he's a wrongfully imprisoned man. Uh, his best friend uh, is friends with me, mm. and he it was his idea um, to use his place um, and to have a studio where we're going to get podcasting gear, videotaping gear. Well, we actually have most of it done, but that was the concept at the time. Mm-hmm. And to build essentially a plug-and-play studio where anybody can come in, you know, not just anybody, you have to be you know, go through the training mm-hmm. little technique there, but so anybody from the community can start a podcast, can have the resources right there, so the only thing they need to do is just put in the effort and then learn how to do it so we can transfer skills to other people, and everybody will, they'll have like podcasting, like coming up will be a professor from Morgan State, um, I talked about, uh, I talk about all the time, Lawrence Brown. He can. He's going to have one on the public health issues that are in Baltimore, and then we have like um, confessions of a convict, which is another guy we we know who was wrongfully imprisoned, uh, came out and tells his story about being locked in solitary for three years and how that affects you. So mm. we have art shows, we have all these different things, and people ready to step up for the activism. It's just really about the, the fundamental idea to any activism, especially when you're white, isn't about having the voice or about doing things for people it's it's about enabling it's about providing structure mm-hmm. so that uh, other people can can take off on their own mm-hmm. and that's 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 what we're trying to do to a certain extent is use my celebrity use my, um, my privilege to whatever means to mm-hmm. enable others instead of enabling myself okay well that yeah I was going to ask you about the the Adnan Syed case uh, now how did you think that's 
serial handled the case? Do you think it was a fair reading of, of the facts? Or well, let's not let's not pretend that I can be unbiased. <laughs> um, I'm friends with the Chowdhrys. I'm too closely related to Anand Said's family mm. to 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 not disclose that information. Uh-huh. But I wasn't when I listened to Serial, and so when I listened to Serial. Um, I left with this idea that I don't know whether or not did it or not, mm-hmm. but there's no way you have a case against him. Mm. By the time I finished Undisclosed, which is Rabia Chowdhury's and a, and a couple of other people's uh, podcast, it gets more into the nuance of it. Mm-hmm. Once you listen to that, it's like, oh, God, he didn't do this. There's no chance. Mm-hmm. So, um, but now that I've become friends with that family, I mean... Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm totally, totally all on their side at this point. In time. You're no longer but, a. But uh, that fair. is why I'm on their side, though. You know, but, sure. but you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg? I, right. I am on their side because I, I do believe that he's innocent. Yeah. yeah, I came away with a lot of questions about Jay. That's that's what I came away with. <laughs> you shouldn't. Though. Though. You shouldn't. <laughs> you shouldn't. Jay. Jay is the the prototypical element of the system. Huh. So they had something on him, a drug case or something like that, uh-huh. and then. The police want to fit a narrative, so you just coax Jay into providing the narrative that you want. I mean, this is like read interview, uh, homicide, uh, 101 kind of investigatory techniques. Interesting. Well, yeah, I, I really want to listen to the undisclosed one, but yeah. So, um, and we talked about. I've been on there twice. So oh, okay. That. Cool, cool. <laughs> awesome. Um, but yeah, no, that was that was a pretty involved uh, case, and yeah, I definitely, definitely did think it was airtight by any means, especially the cell phone evidence given Circa whenever that was in the late 90s. It seemed kind of, <laughs> sounded kind of suspect. I don't really know how, uh, if you wanted to build a, an entire case on that. but Well, I mean, just the timeline like doesn't even work. Mm. It's like, if you, I mean, Woodlawn, where it happened is right here in North Baltimore. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so you, you can go ride that. Everything is the way it was. So you can go try and get from point A to point B the way they say he did, and mm-hmm. you can't do it. It's not mm-hmm. possible. So, like, how those things got slipped through are, are crazy. I mean, he had inadequate counsel. He was Muslim. So you have all those things piling up. The idea that he's in there is preposterous. Mm-hmm. Do you have a theory about who you think maybe they should be looking at? Well, what do you look at when anybody's girlfriend is killed? Mm. Uh, <laughs> you look at the boyfriend. You look yeah, at the husband. I mean, those again. That's that's investigation. That's investigations one on one. You have a dead female. The first place you look at who was sleeping with her, and mm. it wasn't that not. Mm. So you know <laughs> he did in the past, and you know like. I mean, if you can go find one of my old girlfriends if she's dead, following up a leave with me isn't going to help you at all. Uh, so you have to look for the one that's currently there or has some kind of problem. And, okay. You know, that's where that's where you look. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, now, last time uh, we ended by talking about music a little bit, and since we've talked, uh, some members of Rage Against the Machine and, and uh, Chuck D and ah. uh, Be Real all came together as Voltron for the Prophets of Rage uh, thing. Uh, what, what was your what was your take on that? Well, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to the tour that's about to start. Uh-huh. Um, I, I really... Uh, that was like, you know, when it came out, it was like, oh, yes. You know, like we've all been saying, like, Rage has to come back. Yeah. And then it's like, no De La Roca. And you're like, oh, God. I know, right? That was like, it was like a little bit of a ping of regret that that wasn't there, but, you know. <laughs> so I, I did hear uh, Be Real um, in an interview say, hey, man, like, his seat is here and it's warm. It's mm. just up to Zach if he wants to come back or not. Right, right. So, like, I, I think, like, everybody that's, uh, you know, in their 30s right now is probably like, <laughs> Zach, what the hell, man? Like, this is critical. <laughs> uh, so, so, hopefully, that all pans out. I, I hope they do their tour as they are and then Zach can come in and add some new element to it. Because, you know, let these guys run free for this little bit here would make sense. Yeah. But for he's sure. got to. He's got, he's got to come back. I mean, we're, are yeah, you right. kidding me? Like, that's, that's the crux. <laughs> I know, right? We can't. We can't it's the keystone or whatever. So. <laughs> right, right, right. But um, what other music have you been able to listen to lately here? Well, there was really big news today that I kind of got giddy about, and that was uh, I sat down and uh, I pulled up Amazon Prime, and I saw that the Pink Floyd uh, discography was out oh, nice. Amazon Prime. So, so that was exciting. Um, otherwise... 
I don't know. I've been so wrapped up in it that um, I don't have much time to listen to music. So it's always like release music. Mm -hmm. And so release music would be like going back to Rage Mm -hmm. or Tool or Nine Is Nails, um, something like that. Or it's like... Lena Del Rey and Pink Floyd, so I can just like ah, you know, kind of unwind. <laughs> What's your favorite uh, Pink Floyd? Uh, yeah, that's tough. Um, God, you'd have to be. I don't want to be cliched and go with like Dark Side of the Moon or The Wall. I mean, those are um, those are great. Yeah, but it's like, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, to this day, just like playing The Wall from start to finish is just like. I don't right. know. It's like mandatory. Like every like two months or something, it should be like mm-hmm. you should get a reminder on your phone or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I saw uh, the the wall live a couple of years ago. That was that was a pretty intense uh, experience, <laughs> especially. Yeah, with- and all I can all I can really add to that is that. Um, if it's a Roger Waters live, uh-huh. I have no interest. Oh, yeah, it was just the wa- Roger Waters. <laughs> yeah. If it's David Gilmore, then I'm all in. Interesting. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I definitely take the Gilmore side. Okay, Floyd. gotcha, gotcha. Um, well, is there anything else I didn't uh, didn't ask you about that you wanted to talk about here? I never know what the heck I'm supposed to be even thinking about. <laughs> um, I mean, I mean, I don't know. All I can say is that. I'm open to these discussions. I don't want anybody to think that I really have a position or that I'm a liberal or that I'm this or, or, or whatever category you want to put me in. Like the only category I'll willingly put myself into is sciences. I, I'm going to go by the evidence. Mm-hmm. So whatever position anyone else has, don't think that I am a counter position. Uh, I am someone willing to listen to your, your case and listen to your evidence and try to figure out how to incorporate that into the big picture. Uh, like I'm not the enemy. People mm-hmm have to get that under their head. I'm trying to create a society that's safer for you, no matter who you are. Right. It never really bothers me when somebody calls me a name like that, because it's unless they call me a Nazi or something. But, um, you know, like, I'm just like, okay, what if that helps you to call me a liberal or whatever, fine. If that helps you, just, you know, if, if you want to take on what I'm saying, though, that, that would be more interesting to me. But whatever right. whatever label you want to put on that. So, um, well, hey, thanks for, uh, thanks for taking the time to talk to me. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks. It's always a good discussion with you, Rob. You're, uh, you know, well, well uh, articulate, and you have good thought processes here. And I don't have to argue with you about how race is a social construct <laughs> and, and, and you know not a real thing. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's it's very real. It's been today's thing. Like, well, don't black people commit more crime? Oh, brother. Well, <laughs> like no, not really, because not even like black isn't even a category. Like I don't understand what you're saying. It's not a crime causation category. <laughs> if you want to go off arbitrary factors, people with brown hair and brown eyes are really fucking evil. Because because they commit the vast majority of crime compared to everybody else. So, I mean, it's just as much of a label of crime causation as saying that brown hair, brown eye people are more likely to commit crime. I mean, it's, it's, it's preposterousness, and that's what we fight in this damn country. So don't listen to me. Don't listen to somebody else. The only thing you have to listen to me on, though, is just pick up a goddamn book and research it yourself. <laughs> that's a good thing to end on, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right, brother. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.